Hi there, this is David, and welcome to my Top 10 Game Boy RPGs. My childhood could pretty much be divided up into school time and summertime. With summertime came tons of road trips and plane rides, though. And always at my side through these harrowing times away from my NES and SNES was my trusty Game Boy and a sack full of RPGs. Here are some of my favorites. The majority of them played in childhood, with a few others I've only recently played through with the help of translations and emulation. Keep in mind that RPGs were still extremely hard to come by in those days, so I'm also including many games that have RPG elements such as Zelda that I wouldn't otherwise normally include in the list of RPGs. But let's first start with what I'm sure everyone will say is the best. Number 10, Pokemon Yellow. Full disclosure, I've never actually played a Pokemon game in my life, so I just know that if I didn't include Pokemon in here, I'd never hear the end of it. So let's get this out of the way and I'll talk about what I do know, or more precisely, what I think that I know. Pokemon Yellow was a revamped combination of Pokemon Red and Blue where a Pikachu follows you around. But other than that, the gameplay of Gotta Catch Em All remains the same, and man, that must be some hella gameplay, because the storylines essentially kill eight gym leaders. Man, I'm hooked. Where do I sign up? I don't know. Maybe one of these days I'll do a blind playthrough, but in the meantime, let's move on to the meat of this top ten. Number nine. Gargoyle's Quest. The first game in a now forgotten series that spilled onto the NES and SNES began as a spin-off of the infamous, for all the wrong reasons, Goals and Ghosts series, starring Firebrand. But don't be fooled, while Goals and Ghosts is an abomination, Gargoyle's Quest is actually very good. In Japan, the game was branded, no pun intended, Goals and Ghosts Gaiden, but it plays nothing like that god-awful game. Instead of controlling a naked knight looking for his girlfriend, you're instead controlling a fire-breathing, flying, kick-ass gargoyle. The level design is reminiscent of Mega Man or Castlevania. There's a world map to explore, people to talk to, a leveling system, and skill progression. Over the course of the game, you gain the ability to fly further, jump higher, and breathe fire farther, further, faster than ever before, hitting a transformer and... Wait, that's something else. Anyway, back to Gargoyle's Quest. The game's short, even by Game Boy standards, but brevity is the soul of wit, as they say. Firebrand's short jaunt through the underworld is very fun, and it deserves a spot on this list, if only bring more attention to a neglected and forgotten series. Number 8, Roland's Curse 2. This is a Zelda clone through and through, down to the bare-bones story of stopping an evil king, but it improves on the formula by adding party members and a leveling system. As you progress through the game, you'll come across chests that increase your physical and magical attack power, as well as your choice of seven other party members, of whom you can have three with you at any time. Each of them play differently as well, and level up with their own specific treasure chests, and most importantly, you can change who you control at any point just by pressing the select button. With huge levels to explore, multiple people to control, and lots of great treasure to find, as well as excellent music, Roland's Curse 2 is definitely worth checking out. Number 7, God Medicine. This is the only Japan-only game on the list, the game's quirky, and the storyline's extremely unique. Essentially, three friends are eagerly awaiting the release of a new game, Phantom. But, for whatever reason, the game's cancelled. The children, upset, console themselves by playing outside where they stumble upon a cabin. Inside, they're shocked to see a demon in the process of killing three heroes. Once the demon's done wiping the floor with the heroes, he goes back to his world, and the three heroes end up transferring their souls to the three friends. The friends then chase after the demon through the portal, and now find themselves as characters inside the unfinished Phantom game. While the game does break the fourth wall by referencing video game tropes such as fetch quests, the real meat of the plot is that you go back and forth between the Phantom and the real worlds in order to save them both. The game plays your standard turn-based affair with a slight twist of equipping gems onto your weapons to gain special powers. The game is a fun, self-deprecating jaunt through a video game world definitely worth a look. Number 6, Great Greed. This is easily one of the strangest games I've ever played, but it's highly enjoyable, which is a fine line to tread. It's the Captain Planet of JRPGs with a strange habit of naming every character after food. The story's nothing to write home about. Basically, you're a human who gets transported to the world of Green Kingdom and, being a human, you're more powerful than the inhabitants of the kingdom, so it falls to you to save their world from the evil biohazard. Where the game really shines is in its areas to explore, like old record factories and hot fruit forests. Also, the gameplay is extremely unique. While princesses join you throughout the journey, you can only control the hero in battle. Basically, it's a turn-based system where you assign magic to each of the four directional buttons, A attacks, and B dodges. The combat's fast-paced because the enemies will continually attack while you try to make up your mind on what to do. 
Occasionally, the enemy will charge at you, and if you dodge at the right time, they'll stumble and you'll get some free rounds of attacks against them. Elemental spells also have effects in addition to their damage, such as burning, which deals damage over time, or freezing, which freezes the enemy. Number 5, Final Fantasy Adventure. This is known as Secret of Mana in Japan, and it's a true action RPG and quite a good one. You begin as a slave of Emperor Glaive, fighting for your life daily in the Colosseum, and then getting caught up in a story bigger than yourself, namely to help the Gemonites save the Mana Tree and with it, the world, with the help of a varied group of friends who join and leave throughout the course of your adventure. The game plays your standard hack and slash adventure game, but the plot, character development, and leveling system make it feel very polished and more like a traditional RPG. Upon leveling up, you can choose from four stats to level up, which makes for great replay value because each time your hero is a little different. There's also puzzle solving elements in the dungeons and a variety of places to traverse from caves to airships, forests, and deserts. The scope of the game is huge when compared to other games of the time, especially Game Boy games. Number 4, Sword of Hope 2. Much improved from the original game in which you only controlled Prince Theo and pretty much only explored three major areas of your kingdom, the sequel, where you again assume control of Theo, is a vast improvement. Think of the improvements between Lufia 1 and 2, it's that extreme. This time Theo actually leaves his kingdom and explores the world with the help of two additional party members who are a welcome addition because the game, much like its predecessor, can be brutally difficult. The game plays similarly to Shadowgate, where you examine your surroundings and can interact with all sorts of objects which can either help or hinder you on your quest. And movement is a bit different too. You point and click in the direction that you wish to move, and as you move, enemies move too, and if you're in battle, they can end up moving into your battle, and then you have a huge group of monsters on your hands to deal with. This is a serious hidden gem of the Game Boy, and I implore you to check it out if you've never heard of it. Number 3, Final Fantasy Legend 3. This game is about as close to a traditional console experience RPG that you will find on the Game Boy. It's made by the same team that made Final Fantasy Mystic Quest, but this is bigger, fuller, and has a deeper story and more fleshed out world than that abomination. The story follows four youths on an adventure through space and time, and though it's technically a saga game, it feels nothing like one. It's much more Final Fantasy with, with traditional leveling and magic systems, with no mentions of sparking anywhere. If you'd like to see a take on the game with actual saga systems, check out the remake on the DS. Sorry not sorry about the shoutout. The story's epic, spanning the past, present, and future as well as an alternate dimension, but it fails atop its predecessor because it's missing a certain something, charm or maybe heart. It just feels formulaic and by the book. Like they just had to pump out another game, but that doesn't make it bad, it just doesn't make it the best. Number 2, The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening. I know it's sacrilege, but I'm not a huge fan of Zelda, especially the newer games. I can't do 3D platforming to save my life and just forget about targeting combat, it's a hot mess. Also, gaining hearts rather than levels seems pretty basic, but I digress, that's a different video for a different time. Today, let's talk about Link's Awakening. As a 2D Zelda game, it's actually playable, and believe it or not, it's my second favorite Zelda game. I'll let you stew on what my favorite is. Surprisingly, the game doesn't take place in Hyrule, Star Zelda, or Ganon, and there's not even a mention of the Triforce. While it's still a Zelda game at its core, I like the changes. It seems more story-driven than the first three Zeldas, has nods to Mario, involves puzzles, whoops for alleviating backtracking, fun abilities that you don't have to use just to get through the next dungeon, and quirky surprises. Also, it borrows a lot from a Japan-only game, For the Frog the Bell Tolls, even guest starring a character from that game. It just seems like the developers were really free to explore and experiment with the series in a way that they don't do today and the sum of the parts resulted in a standout masterpiece for the system. And number one, Final Fantasy Legend 2. Easily my favorite game on the system, and much like Sword of Hope, it's a massive step up from its predecessor in gameplay, music, graphics, and replayability. The story follows a group of friends who leave their hometown to search for the hero's father and the 77 magi whom others are trying to use to become gods. A little known fact is that once you obtain the magi, you can use them for customization because different magi bes bestow different abilities on your characters. In order to accomplish this goal, you have to climb a tower which connects all the different worlds. Each world is unique in layout, theme, towns, characters, and storyline. 
It's a joy to see each story unfold and explore the worlds ranging from deserts to oceans to giants to an oriental world. At the beginning of the game, you can also create your own party from four different classes. Humans, who are your physical hitters, mutants, your mages, robots, whose stats grow and change depending on what they're equipped with, and monsters, who grow and change depending on what meats that they eat. This allows for great replay value and is probably my favorite aspect of the game because each playthrough you create a different party and you enjoy a different experience. This has been David, and if you like this, please let me know by liking, commenting, and subscribing. I can't wait to hear your opinions, and have a good day.